In recent times, all of us were shocked to the core by the images we saw from Minneapolis of the, the dying and death of George Floyd. These sorts of things have happened before, but we'd never seen it quite like this. And we'd never heard words like, I can't breathe. They couldn't be simpler, but they've echoed right around the world and in the heart of anyone who saw those images and in the heart of many more who haven't seen the images. George Floyd is the name that we now all know, but he's not the only one who suffered like this. Others weren't caught on camera. Names less familiar to us like Armored Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, and Sean Reed. All of those were killed in the past month. So George Floyd isn't just an individual. He's come to represent, as it were, a whole people and a, a radical injustice being done that is an affront, in fact, to the human family. Now, as a result, it struck a chord in hearts right around the world in a very unusual way. In the USA alone, in over 350 cities, all kinds of protests have erupted. And again, we've seen the images on television and in other media. But around the world, in London, but here in Brisbane too, we had 30,000 people gather to protest and to say enough is enough. The phrase that we've often heard in these recent days is we have reached a tipping point, not just in the USA, certainly there, but around the world in dealing with this running sore, kind of a cancer at the heart of the human family, the cancer that we call racism. Back, way back in 1991, there was a Royal Commission here in Australia into Indigenous deaths in custody and it made 339 recommendations. Now since 1991, more than 400 Aboriginal people have died in custody and only a handful of those recommendations has been implemented. Not a single police officer has ever been charged for any of those deaths. There may be many reasons for that, but it's an extraordinary fact. So I have with me today Cynthia Rowan. Cynthia is Indigenous and works with our team at Evangelisation Brisbane. But she does many other things and has done many things through her life. Not such a long life, but Cynthia has um, a very interesting CV. So I really want to uh, hear from Cynthia and share her words with you at a moment like this, which is and has to be in some sense a tipping point. So Cynthia, if I could just ask, these dramatic events in the USA particularly, I mean, how have they affected you? I mean, you've seen the images, but they, they obviously touch into your life in a way that they wouldn't touch into mine. So how have they affected you? It, um, it really brought home the facts that the system that um, perpetuates violence against Indigenous people, but more importantly, when people are convicted of whatever crime and they're sentenced, they're not sentenced to death, they're sentenced to undertake incarceration for a period. Mm. But what's happened, people are dying. Yeah. And it's reminded us that it's the systemic failings of the organisations. And we've So had... it's not just an exception, it's not just an accident. We are talking about something that's systematic, part of the system and even part of the culture built into the culture in ways that people like me perhaps are not even conscious of? I was reminded this morning in a phone call um, by someone that participated in the rally about how they felt about it um, in terms of the times that he spent talking to his daughters before he went to the rally. Um, that is about protesting the fact that no one was charged, whether it's the police or whether it was custodial mm. officers where Aboriginal men in particular have died. 
the story of the indigenous people in Australia is a bit different from the African American community in the USA, isn't it? Yes, we we still have um, that level of racism. There still is. Um, we prepare our children from a young age of how to behave when they um, come in contact with police. Um, it's about their safety. It's so that they'll survive the encounter. And that's not talking about those people who are incarcerated. Yeah. The, the African-American people, uh, of course, were imported into the USA as slaves. But the story of the Indigenous peoples of Australia is that you weren't imported. We were the imports, but you were here and yet you've been made slaves, as it were, in your own land. That's correct. Mm. We, you'll go to any library and you'll see photos of men and women in chains. Yeah. And um, in Queensland in particular, with the whole discussion around the stolen wages, um, people worked on properties and everywhere else. They did the same amount of work as everyone else but they got a lower income and the rest was taken by the government. And then you had the whole thing of Australia being terra nullius. In other words, it belonged to nobody, so that the Aboriginal peoples were simply regarded as nobody and you weren't even recognised as Australian citizens. That's correct. Until car comparatively recent times. So it's almost a denial of the humanity that goes on when you're dealing with racism. That's correct. Yeah. And it's it's insidious in society. It's sometimes referred to as casual racism. It's not as um, explicit as it used to be um, as a child growing up. Um, you were told that you could do these things or you couldn't do those things because you were Aboriginal. Mm. But now it is that subtle denial of access. And even today, um, after all these years of work, walking on earth and being in the Catholic community, um, sometimes it's, um, it's people who have that belief and sometimes it's people that don't know how to engage with Aboriginal people. I think there's a lot of that in Australia. See, I think in my lifetime, many people have wanted to do the right thing by Indigenous peoples to heal the wound that's a running sore at the heart of the nation. But nothing seems to work. I mean, money is not is part of the answer, but it's not the whole answer. Land is certainly a part of the answer, but it's not the whole answer. So together, uh, a moment like this ca can give us new impetus in searching for what is a genuine solution. Because you know, the symptoms of, of social alienation among Indigenous peoples are very real, aren't they? De the early death, even of those not incarcerated, the, the life expectancy is much lower, the, the, the rate of incarceration is truly shocking. But even in things like the level of domestic violence, I mean domestic violence is everywhere, but it's a big problem in many Aboriginal communities, that the problems of drugs and alcohol, and, and these are all symptoms of a people who have been enslaved in their own land, as it were, it seems to me. That's part of it, yeah. but there's still a very high number of Indigenous people that are really high success stories within their families and within their communities. Yep. Um, in terms of... You're um, one of those, I hasten to add. Yeah, and it's, and it's about support from the family, but I think with anyone, you have to ask. So just ask, if you've got a question about something, ask, otherwise you'll never have the answer to it. Secondly, in relation to the amount of money over the years that government has provided to Aboriginal programs, it's because someone in the bureaucracy thinks it's a great idea, whereas Aboriginal people keep saying, this is what will work, this is what will work, but no one listens. Well, that, that seems to me the key. What is it that makes it impossible, uh, it seems, for governments and others, again, like myself, to, to want to do the right thing, but the most important thing is something we fail to do, and that is listen. I mean, speak to me about the kind of listening you the, think the is Uluru required. Statement, the Uluru yeah. Statement is a case in point, but instead it's taken 
to a political response to it instead of that human response to it. Mm -hmm. It's um, all these Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people from all over the country. They was talking for a long time before they went there and had that discussion. Uh, instead, there's this um, little statement that says, oh, they just want a voice. It's not just a voice. No. It's about hearing. It's about the practical implementations of things. It's not a program for the sake of having a program. It's responding to the needs of people wherever they are. And it's not one size fits all, which is the same for the whole of society. Mm. It's about being responsive to the needs of the community, um, just like we do in our various parishes. Um, the priest and the parish council responds to the parishioners in their parish. And so it's for me, the expectations in terms how government should engage um, but also, in particular, how we as church should be engaging with Aboriginal people. Yeah, it's not the government has a crucial role, uh, but it's not just the government, is it? No. It's got to be the whole community, because uh, if you ask why, <clears throat> why did the government not accept the Uluru statement? What's your what's your answer to that? Why didn't they accept it? It's it's the political party it's part of their beliefs that they're pushing rather than looking at it from that humane perspective um, about progressing as a country uh, rather than the political ide ideology of that particular group. Mm, mm. So it's, it's really disappointing because we're in the 21st century, we're a modern contemporary Australian society and um, they're engaging with people that have connection and continual cultural connection for over 50,000 years yeah. to this country. And we're inviting everyone that if you claim Australia has your home, you're, you're also owning that history. So instead we have this mentality where people are saying, no, we don't want this, we want that, we don't want to give you a voice but Aboriginal languages have been spoken to in this country for over 30,000 years, or yeah. 50 or 60,000. And the non-Indigenous population of this country, I think, have never ever really believed that we can actually learn something from the Indigenous peoples. That we, it's always been, we can teach you, but we can't learn from you. And yet, as I grow older, I can see that there are vast realities and truths that we, the non-Indigenous population, can only learn by listening to the Indigenous people. A case in point of the fires before Christmas and after Christmas, um, talking about the coal fire burning, that was a tradition that's still being practised by uh, different Aboriginal nations across the country. And now um, some of the rural fire brigades are engaging in that practice themselves because it's about um, the land and how it regenerates. So you just don't have it sake of just burning the grass to get rid of the undergrowth. It's the way that you do it so that you've still got the plants and the animals surviving the process. Mm. And that's a practice that's gone on for tens of thousands of years. Mm. So, um, it's there for people to access. Yeah, so in other words, part of the listening has to be learning, an openness to actually learn from people that we thought were incredibly primitive. That's and right. in some ways, technologically, the Indigenous peoples were primitive when the Europeans arrived. But in other ways, they were an extraordinarily sophisticated people. Correct. spiritually and culturally and in all kinds of other ways without gilding the lily that's the truth and yet the attitude was one of white supremacy that we knew you didn't you were primitive and we were very sophisticated the truth looks much more complex now doesn't it yes it is and today through technology there is um, a lot of information that people can access freely um, on the internet and part of the Reconciliation Action Plan 
um, that'll be some of the stuff that I'll take the parishes through. That's a, a part of the pilot for it. Yeah, well, that, that, that's a very important step forward in this part of the world with regard to the church. I mean, when you look back, the, the, the story of the church's engagement with Indigenous peoples has been, in some ways, a very sad story. I, I, I've been across to Stradbroke Island a few times and there we had the Passionist Fathers who came to Stradbroke Island to preach the gospel to the Indigenous people. They were full of good energy and good intention, but in the end it was a kind of a pathetic failure. Even though the, the Indigenous people of Stradi remember them with a certain affection, so it was, they were trying to do the right thing, but they ended up doing the wrong thing. So the question is, what is the right thing, say, for the church with regard to indigenous peoples? I mean, where, and where is Jesus in all of this? It's about um, that recognition and respect that we come to the table as equals. And that has been the core of the problem. Yeah, and that, that ha is the problem because, in fact, we haven't, come to the table as equals. That's correct. Mm. And it's about having that respectful relationship and it's respecting the diversity that um, there's all this wealth of knowledge uh, and spirituality that Aboriginal people mm. could bring to the table, but also in sharing it from the different cultures within our parishes now. It is so exciting and there's so much potential when you look at what is Australia today? Mm. And it's not about adopting someone else's culture. Mm. It's about that understanding, that respect. And it's about navigating respectfully that relationship. And it's like any relationship, you have to work at it. You have to be respectful. You have to engage and create opportunities to move forward. Yeah. Um, it's a question again of listening to each other. Uh, and, and an ability to learn from the religious experience of Indigenous people. This is hard for people like myself. But there, 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 do you see there's a real uh, consonance, as it were, that, uh, between Indigenous spiritualities and the Gospel? Do you see them as not only compatible, but somehow needing each other? I think it is, and it's about living the Gospel. Mm. because when you look at Aboriginal spirituality and belonging to country, it's about you have got a responsibility for all aspects of it. It's not just uh, the spirituality of, um, of like a mass or a ceremony. Mm. It's about how you live and breathe it, how you look after the land, how you take what you need, you don't... Uh, abuse and use all the resources, you have to think about who's coming from behind you mm. for the next generation so that you're utilising what you need now, you're preparing and planning for the future for generations to come after you. So it's about being intentional in your thinking and in your spirituality. So it's not something you practise when you go to a ceremony. It's something that's part of your life. It's like now in care for creation. And, you know, our common home through Laudato Sea. So it's about living every moment intentionally in your life, in your relationship with people and your, in your relationship with the land. Yeah, it's very striking, as you say, uh, the way in which the vision that Pope Francis gives us in Laudato Sea is profoundly attuned to indigenous spirituality. It's uncanny and it's providential. But, but as you say, it's not just a matter of us having a welcome to country or a smoking ceremony. They can be cosmetic touches. It's got to be something much deeper, I think, doesn't it? And more comprehensive in the way we live and relate to each other and relate to the created world. And it's about that inclusiveness in that whole process. So including and welcoming and creating that space for Aboriginal people to be a part of the whole process. The, the Reconciliation Action Plan is, is something that's taken a lot of hard work 
by people like you and plenty of others. And I was delighted as the bishop to, to see that it actually produced, all the hard work produced something as good as this reconciliation action plan. Because we do need action. It's not just enough for us to sit around and talk uh, or to watch these atrocious images on the television and feel moved to the core of our being. Um, but what's your sense of the Reconciliation Action Plan and, and its importance? The Reconciliation Action Plan across the parishes is the beginning. Um, for some of the parishes, they have been involved in reconciliation for quite a few years and a lot of the parishes participated and supporting Aboriginal people to go to um, the meeting between Pope Paul II and Aboriginals in, in Alice Springs. Springs in 86, Pope John Paul, yeah. Yes, and a lot of parishes participated in the March for Reconciliation. Um, and some of the parishes, they have got placards of, of reconciliation already in their churches. So for the Reconciliation Action Plan, it's, uh, it comes in as a document that's like a roadmap of where we're going to from here because some of the parishes have a relationships already yeah. and some of them don't. And so it's a matter of guiding people through that process and recognition, uh, relationships, respect and opportunities. They're the key elements of the Reconciliation Action Plan and it's practical things that people could do. Mm. And do you think the whole Black uh, Lives Matter movement can give greater impetus to the Reconciliation Action Plan? I think it's highlighted it, mm. um, but I think that it's a chance for, for people to look at your own backyard because you need to get your own house in order before you go out to work in the neighbourhood, so to speak. <laughs> no, but it's not just over there in the USA and on That's television. Right. It is in our backyard, but it's also in our mind and our heart. And one of the things I like about this plan is it is about action. Uh, we really need to act, but in new ways and, and action born of a new kind of listening. But in the end, it seems to me that, that the action has as its goal a change of culture. Because as someone said to me some time ago, culture will eat strategy for breakfast. You can have all the strategies you like, but if the culture remains unchanged, then the strategies won't work. And our culture, I think now, has ingrained into it an almost unconscious but very potent racism. Yes, it is. And it's about people changing their behaviour. Yep. It's about their behaviour being challenged. It's about how they use language and how that language is being challenged, like I would never, when I was younger, I was reciting to pull someone up for calling me a part Aborigine. Mm -hmm. And I used to get on my horse and say, well, what part do you think I'm Aboriginal? Is my big toe, my left knee? or?" Uh, but now I just simply say, that's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. I've identified as Aboriginal person. I also identify my other heritage, but people choose to see me as Aboriginal. They don't, mm. they don't refer to me as Scottish. No, no. Do you, do you identify as Indigenous? You obviously do. Yes, I yeah. identify as Birragaba. That's yeah. my nation. Okay. So it is about language, I agree, and the language in my lifetime has changed quite dramatically, thank God. But it's about action and it's about mindset and it's about how your heart is set and in the end it's about culture. And that's why the RAP, the Reconciliation Action Plan, is, is a very important and potentially powerful thing. So there we have it. The invitation to everyone who might be following this, particularly if you're from the Archdiocese of Brisbane, to take this Reconciliation Action Plan seriously, especially at a time like this, which we hope is some kind of tipping point, because this is the right time and Australia and Brisbane are the right place for us to really set out on a new phase of a journey that is already long, but we have a long, long way to go. The change has to be deep, in some ways painful, but it will lead to Australia becoming the kind of nation 
God wants us to be, where Indigenous and white Australia are not a curse to each other, but are a blessing. Thank you.